I'm uh, rolling. Okay. Okay. okay, you're rolling. So uh, I, I would like to ask you some non-formal questions. Okay. About your childhood. Uh, Where are you from originally? Oh, okay. Who was your parents? Uh, How did you start uh, draw uh, to draw? Well, um, I. Uh, oh, it's gone. No, it's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, I don't think it's especially relevant, but uh, the, uh, whoops, um, I was, uh, I was uh, born in upstate New York, uh, Rochester, New York. Um, my, uh, I started drawing and whatnot, uh, I guess, early on. I did some films, you know, as a eight-year-old, I did some animated films with uh, crayons and whatnot, you know. Um, those are my first cartoons, and um, uh, I'm pretty much what little I can draw, which isn't that much, by the way. Um, I'm pretty much an autodidact. I just taught myself. I never had any formal uh, art training or anything. I went to school here in New York at Columbia University, and uh, then later I went to the Film Institute uh, in California. A lot of my life is going back and forth between New York and, and California and working with some really great animators. Um, see, to me, animation, making these films, it's not a, to me, it's analogous to a live action type of direction. It's, um, I think of the animators as the actors in a film. And um, if there's any drawing of mine that ends up in the final film, I worry about the film. I don't want to see my drawing on, on film. You know, I want to see people who can can really act uh, as uh, on film. You know, and, and some of the best animators I've ever worked with, uh, you know, are now um, working with Disney and Warner's and whatnot. Um, Mark Kausler, uh, who animated the scene for me of uh, Daffy Duck singing like Mel Torme, is uh, a great animator and is working on a great film himself right now uh, about a cat um, uh, scored to an old 1930s piece called It's the Cat. And um, I'm looking forward to working with him on that more. Uh, let's see, Doug Compton is a great animator here in New York City. He's really in New Jersey. Um, well, I've done a lot of stuff with him recently. He did the basic dance step that you see in Blooper Bunny. Um, we started with a, if you've seen the picture, it's a, um, it's a musical number where, where that the characters keep screwing up in one way or another, and we had to, and it's done like there's outtakes, and uh, we, so, but the basic dance part was, was designed by, by Doug, and executed by Doug, and the uh, um, bloopers are, uh, you know, our additions. Um, Nancy Beeman is another great animator that I worked with a lot. Um, I guess the distinction I'm trying to make is that um, the kind of films I like to do are, aren't directly personal in the way something like a film by Kathy Rose is directly personal. I would like to, I'm trying to do a larger production and here to, so that you can see a multiplicity of voices and a multiplicity of acting rather than just a single actor. You see what I mean? I like a variety of types of movement and types of designs. Um, and I think that's the kind of thinking that um, is typical of uh, the classic Hollywood cartoons, um, where you that you've seen with Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and and the Disney cartoons over the years. I think that's that's the approach that was was taken to give the animators a fair amount of autonomy and um, to you know, direct more through timing, how the characters are timed, and how the characters are are um, are act um, than through 
so much what the visual style of the film is, although the visual, visual style is also very important. It's, it's, more of a, it's more of a far ranging thing, and I suppose it's more commercial than uh, you know, a George Griffin film or a, uh, or a uh, Kathy Rose film. At least what I guess what you'd say is it's a um, um, at least it's a attempt to come to terms with the kind of uh, cartoon making that's most famous in this country. Uh, I mean, let's face it, the the uh, cartoons that have had the biggest um, influence in the world are really the Disney cartoons and, and the Warner Brothers. And it was a sort of a thrill for me to try to come to terms with that, to enter into that and um, make some sort of contribution to that folklore, you know. But it, it's, it's personal to me and it's also um, goes beyond me, you know. It's not, it's not about me. It's about the characters. It's about Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and, and what have you. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have strong opinions as to, you know, how, where I think the characters should go and what I think the characters should do. I have very strong opinions. In fact, too strong, because Warner's uh, doesn't agree with me on most stuff, but, uh, um, which is why I left Warner Brothers. But uh, um, in the meantime, uh, uh, I did get away with making, oh, I'd say five or six short films I think are very, very good, you know, and that was more than I thought I could get away with over there, so, um, yeah, I feel good about my association with, with Warner Brothers, um, and right now I'm trying to do stuff more independently, uh, uh, working with animators on the East Coast, um, that's more than you want to know, I should think, Irina, oh. it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, uh, uh, how, how do you find and uh, how do you create your characters? Well, the way a film starts for me is, is with a story. I come in at it through the story. Um, now, story is uh, sort of a misnomer. I mean, by story, usually people think uh, scripts, writing. And although that enters into it, um, it's writing more in the sense of a visual writing. It's uh, storyboards, um, different pictures of characters doing something, you know, in sequence. Uh, and it, you get you, it, basically there, there, there are all these different elements. There's, I'd say, the story comes first, the idea for the film, and um, uh, then. You know the execution of the storyboard, which is like little miniature drawings of the all of the action. You know what a storyboard is, um, and uh, then there's character design, which is a separate issue altogether. Um, it's not necessary for the drawings on the storyboard to even necessarily. It, it, they they should have a vague resemblance to what the characters are like, but they don't have to be the same. You know, it's like in fact. I'd say drawing a storyboard, if you're, you want to almost do it in real time, you want to do it so quickly that, because you don't want to lose the spontaneity of the action, because here you're going to all this trouble making a cartoon with all, like, you know, 24 drawings per frame or 12 drawings per second, uh, 12 or 24 drawings per second, and, you know, it's very uh, arduous, it's very uh, um, a mechanical process, so any point where you can, um, uh, recapture that sense of spontaneity, you want to recapture it, and that's largely at the beginning. So the storyboards, I think, should be very loose, very loosely drawn, very rough. Um, and, and then it's sort of up to the layout artists and the animators to reconcile the action that's represented in the storyboard with whatever the design of the character is. One of the great things about the Warner's characters was that they're designed so beautifully. Um, uh, the Warner's characters as they were developed by people like uh, Chuck Jones and Chris Freeling is that they were so flexible. They, they, for me, they had the right combination of, of 
flexibility and, and character detail. A lot of the designs I see today in commercial animation are actually actually limit the acting. I, I, I think if you look at something like um, uh, Prince of Egypt, I find the acting limited because the drawings are over um, over designed. The uh, the characters are over designed, so they 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 lack flexibility. But I think that's not the true of that film. It's true of a, a great deal of, of film. This is just my personal taste. You know, I mean. Um, I, I do think that uh, the big studios, in the name of realism, whatever that is, you know, realism, uh, um, has sacrificed a lot recently in terms of uh, just the cartooniness that they used to have. I mean, I'm all for very cartoony cartoons, you know, and um, uh, I think sometimes they are overly conscious of 3D effects. Uh, shading on the characters, all these little tchotchkes that don't really add to the character or add to the story or add to the spontaneity. They tend to add to the sense that it looks classy or something, you know, and it's a safe, you know, um, finished looking product and family friendly so they can take their kids, people can take their kids to it or something. But I, I'm not thrilled, despite this boom in animation we have, I'm not thrilled with a lot of the studio output at the moment, so that's again why I left the studio after about eight years at Warner Brothers, um, because I just really wasn't happy with, with uh, what they were, the direction the characters were going. As a matter of fact, two of the films I made are sort of parodies of uh, where the direction I thought the studio was going. Um, Blue for Bunny is about first seeing the characters the way the studio wants you to see them, which is happy and smiley faced and they love each other and they say hooray for Bugs Bunny and all of this. And then in the outtakes, which we've provided, of course there are no outtakes in cartoons, it's just our joke, um, we see that the characters you know, are competitive and, and mean spirited and really hate each other the way they should, you know, in a comedy uh, situation and the way they used to, you know, I mean the cartoons the Warren's cartoons used to be based on very strong uh, uh, action, very violent slapstick, you know, and there's been a tendency to get away from that recently because um, the emphasis is on selling the characters as friendly, you know, uh, characters that have spin-off toys and so that you want to get your kids, but they're not as funny as they used to be is our problem. So. So basically, Blooper Bunny was a satire on the idea of, uh, of uh, you know, how the, the you know, the, the, the characters themselves in the film almost protest their, their uh, commodification, their, their, the desire of the studio to uh, make them sweet. You know, now they're, you know, in Blooper Bunny in the outtakes, it allows them to be themselves again. Um, the, another one I did, well, so I'll wait for this, yeah. Wait. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have the right, is that the angle you want? Yeah, yeah. She, she's oh, okay. going. She's doing yeah. our, something artistic. Yeah. Yeah, there you are. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, yeah, so when I was a kid, uh, my first uh, experience in, in animation was totally self-taught. Um, I think I was seven or eight years old or something and, and watched some cartoons on, on television uh, and felt I had to, I think a lot of people have had this experience, uh, uh, not just me, uh, felt I had to sort of reinvent the wheel. Uh, right, that's what I turned out doing because I didn't really know how uh, animated films were made or anything. Um, but I was aware of, you know, film projectors I thought I had a film projector and eight and old eight millimeter film projector, not unlike this old 16 millimeter film projector here. And, um, you know, so I could see it was frame by frame. And uh, um, I sort of created a fake uh, animation stand, although it was, it was, uh, it was shot, hor we shot it horizontal, not, not vertical. I guess once I tried to shoot it 
uh, from overhead as well. But um, you know, as long as the camera was on a tripod, it was close enough. You know, but these were very crude. Obviously, I was a little kid, but uh, I was pleased enough with uh, the uh, results. You know, so that experience stayed with me. Um, I, I kept on making more of these little eight millimeter uh, films and fifteen millimeter films in the, the fifth and sixth grades. And uh, I remember there's this one little piece of my drawing was was terrible and, and it still is bad. Um, that uh, I remember one little piece of animation I did that I actually liked, um, which was a roller coaster. I was probably imitating some cartoon I'd seen or something. I, I don't even know. It was a roller coaster, and I really got the timing right. Was the first car was just going over, and then <laughs> everything fell uh, as it went over the the hill. And I looked at that, and I thought, gee, this is, this is exciting. Um, so that, I felt good about that. The cartoons were called, <laughs> geez, um, Mr. Goody's Car Ride was my, my first cartoon, uh, followed by, by Carnival. Um, this character, Mr. Goody, was ba loosely based on my brother. He had curly hair and, uh, and whatnot, um, like my brother. Um, but then, uh, unfortunately for me, I, I stopped uh, drawing uh, um, because I got too mature, supposedly, for it. You know, I was, I was a serious student, and uh, um, of course, if I had been really smart, I would have kept uh, drawing and kept uh, working uh, through high school. Um, but I didn't, you know. I, I think I became an English major. I was at Columbia University. Um, I was still deeply into film criticism. I, I wrote a lot on, on movies. I was the, the first uh, movie reviewer for Rolling Stone, uh, the magazine Rolling Stone. Uh, this was the 60s, uh, you know, crazy druggy period. And um, uh, started to write. I never lost my affection for these, these cartoons. Um, particularly the Warner Brothers cartoons, um, directed by people like Tex Avery, um, Chuck Jones, and uh, Fritz Freeling. Um, and uh, actually started writing about these films as a historian. Uh, I also mounted retrospectives at uh, museums like the Museum of Modern Art and, uh, and whatnot. Because um, this was a period where cartoons were were largely taken for granted uh, and not uh, particularly, uh, no one was particularly encouraged to get into animation. And no one considered it a career option, believe me, it was, the times were very different. Um, I think it's amazing when you see, I see now the uh, amount of, of animation literacy that's around, uh, even in high schools, uh, people are so aware of, 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 of animation and cartoons as, as an art form, uh, or even thinking of it possibly as an art form, none of this stuff was even considered, except by a few of us, you know, we, just because we liked the stuff so much. But um, when I was starting, uh, uh, it wasn't even, the industry was sort of dead anyway in the uh, late 60s or early 70s. It was a dismal period for uh, Hollywood cartoons. So. When I mounted these retrospectives at the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney and whatnot, it was it was almost like we were commemorating a lost form. You know, there 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 wasn't uh, uh, cartoons didn't have the vitality that they had previously had. Um, so I was surprised when ultimately I ended up making uh, cartoons um, for studios. Uh, the way it happened is odd. I I again I I written so much on the um, animation and, and Disney and Warner Brothers, uh, particularly uh, films by Tex Avery and uh, uh, Chuck Jones and Frizz Freeling, that um, the studio actually became aware that I was doing this. Um, and soon I became a sort of known as an expert on the characters. Um, not just what they'd say, what they'd say, or the type of lines they'd have in dialogue, but also how they would move, how they would think, basically their personalities. And um, 
at some point, uh, I got a call from Warner Brothers um, asking me to write uh, scripts for the characters who were barely doing anything at the time. They were in occasional commercials and uh, ads and occasional, you know, made occasional token appearances in these things called compilation specials, which were these TV cheats where they basically have new animations of Bugs Bunny say, say, I think I'll go to, uh, to Poughkeepsie, you know, and then you cut to a shot of Bugs Bunny in Poughkeepsie, or it's like Bugs Bunny saying, hey, I guess I'll play golf, then you cut to a pre-existent uh, shot of Bugs Bunny playing golf. They were cheaters, really, um, and rather dismal, but that was the state of the industry at the time. Um, so I ended up writing and then there was a fire and everything ended up in flames. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, uh, basically I was recruited by the studio as an expert in the characters and uh, eventually uh, came to uh, direct uh, the characters. Uh, my drawing, terrible. Um, was it good enough to convey the idea of what's uh, going on? Yeah. and my appreciation for the animators I worked with, particularly, you know, I worked with some geniuses in my opinion. Mark Kausler is a genius, uh, Doug Thompson, a genius, uh, Nancy Beeman, a genius. It was a privilege to work with them, you know, and uh, I still am, so that's good for me. And um, uh, there's uh, Dan Haskett, I did a film with. Um, Basically, what I do is conceive the project, write the films, and write them visually as well as, as the dialogue, and work with layout artists and uh, um, uh, animators, and, uh, and also do the timing. The timing is what's really important in, to me in, in, in animation. It's, uh, it's sort of, especially when you look at the uh, early Disney stuff uh, in the 30s and early 40s, and all of the best Warner cartoons from the 40s and 50s, it's like almost everything comes down to, to timing, uh, how long an expression is held, uh, um, the acting of, of the characters. Um, uh, you know, this is what's uh, really so great about Chris's stuff. Chuck's stuff. Um, the amazing thing about directors like Chris Drilling and Chuck Jones, though, is that they, well, they came in so early. They came in from in the 20s and 30s. It's as if um, the, the form, which they did so much to create, uh, was going to uh, die with them. And in animation, several generations were skipped. I mean, here are these people who would be, Chris would be 95 now, Chuck is 80 or something. Um, um, it's as if the form was just identified with these people. And uh, I think one of the things I did that was important at Warner's was to uh, bring a different generation into it. Uh, when we made The Duchesses, which was the first short subject, um, that the studio had made, it was the first Looney Tune the studio had made in about 20 years. Um, we had a, such a generational mix on the film, you know, there'd be someone who was 80 years old sitting next to someone who was uh, like 16 years old. You know, it's like Hollywood cartoons had skipped uh, two, three generations. Um, and uh, I, was happy to get the characters uh, back on the big screen again because these characters are really theatrical short subject characters and uh, they work best that way. They don't work as well in features or anything else. It's, they're really ideal for seven minutes of uh, action. You know. um, anyway, yeah. what else? Finan what? Financial. What? Oh, financial. Yeah, well, um, thinking about the budgets for these pictures, um, it's very hard to get a sense of what the budget of any 
film in the studio really is because the the budget then what's Warner Brothers trying to stop me from saying this um the uh Warner's uh probably wouldn't want me to say this but the the fact of the matter is that budgets in uh in studio films are largely fictional things you know it's very difficult to find out how much even when you're making the film how much anything actually costs because so much overhead studio overhead is added and fictional costs are, are piled on um uh, so i think blooper bunny on paper was might have been half a million dollars um maybe not that much uh but a lot of money uh the actual cost was probably closer to a hundred thousand dollars um i recently made a film with using an old uh, nixon richard nixon campaign song and it was just a homemade little film but it was a shock to me to make a homemade film again because you know the budget for that was three hundred dollars you know three hundred and it struck me uh, amazing how much of the cost in studio films is is obviously added on and obviously uh, fictional you know it's for people to keep their employees paid and keep you know to get, keep the executives making big salaries and uh and whatnot um so um yeah the other stuff i've done since warner's in fact is is are, are really economy things but i found you can use the same techniques studio animation well you know it's it's easy uh, um, basically the importance of the timing again the importance of the story the storyboard um, all the components are the same uh, no matter what the budget is for me um, are you making commercials um, I may be making a series of little commercials right now for a production company called uh, Cleverly One. Uh, we're doing, we did this before with these, it's this, these strange logos where every week there's a different logo uh, where um, characters uh, uh, basically uh, uh, die. You know, there's these alternate death scenarios <laughs> for each, for each one. And they're very, they're, they're a challenge. The first ones we did were a challenge because they were, is trying to get things to read in two seconds. You know, getting action to read in two seconds is hard, you know, because two seconds isn't a very long time. Um, so uh, the first series we did was, was these, these little silhouette characters drowning, you know, in one way or another. They're either attacked by a squid or they're attacked by, um, you know, sharks or they sink like Buster Keaton does in uh, the boat um, or any number of other things. Uh, right now we're going to be doing a series that is similar with astronauts uh, uh, getting into trouble in one way or another. Also dying. Also dying, right. <laughs> or something. Uh, I think we're going to do what it's going to be. We're, I'm not sure yet, but what it's going to be is, is you know, we're actually going to use that sound, you know, of, of, of Neil Armstrong. It was like, that's one small step for a man, you know, but each time he puts his foot down, something new happens. Like the first time he, la he says he slips on a banana peel or something, like there's a banana peel in space, or he, he walks off the capsule and goes into quicksand, or he, uh, 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 you know, or the, the other astronaut like blows into his tube and he inflates into a balloon. You know, anything that reads very simply in two seconds. It, but I don't know why, but it's, uh, it's, it's fun to do these things reading in, in two seconds because it's like if you can get it to read at all, it's, a, it's an achievement. And, and uh, so TV. Is it advertising for funeral company? No, <laughs> no, no. It's 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 a production company by these two writers who feel they're misused by the studio, so they want to picture themselves as 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 dying uh, a horrible death each week. Um, it's it's a sardonic. Uh, approach to a uh, corporate logo. Um, what, what else have I done? Uh, you know, other independent things I've done, I've done like logos for uh, Comedy Central. Again, uh, many of the same animators, uh, Doug Compton, again, a great animator, uh, one of the greatest, uh, East Coast, thank God, a great East Coast animator. Um, wonderful. Uh, there we did the, 
the we basically again with the design is something you do the board and then the design is something totally other that you you construct and and um, because uh, uh, you don't want to lose the spontaneity drawing the board that's where you get your gags you see so if you start fretting about how the the, the characters are designed when you're drawing the board uh, you lose the feel of the action of things happening fast you know so it's best if you draw the board really fast um, and then the design is something else so the design on these elephants is based on uh, Edward Nast, the uh, elephants and donkeys, you know, the standard Democrat, Republican elephants and donkeys.